What is your number one problem you experience in your relationships? Today, we're going to be talking about nine of the top reported problems people experience in their relationships and some of the things you can do to help overcome them. If you'd like to find out more about how to improve your relationship, head over to therelationshipmaze.com where we have lots of free resources and our online relationship program. And please press subscribe now so you can tune into every episode. Welcome to today's podcast. And today we're going to be talking about nine of the most commonly reported relationship problems. We're going to explore some of the things that you can do to help overcome these issues or even prevent them from happening in the first place, because these are things that that crop up in many, many relationships. So today we're going to start with uh, the first commonly reported problem, which is lack of effort. Yeah, which is kind of quite a broad uh, description, and under this head of lack of effort, there are lots of different experiences that you might have in your relationship. What we commonly experience is that uh, after a while, particularly if the relationship has been going on for a few years, a lot of couples then kind of settle into a routine, into a lack of general effort to connect with each other, to have fun together, to do something together. And this might be due to all sorts of other external factors that we'll look at later on. So, yeah, why is it important? It's important that you actually do something together once in a while with your partner, that you make time for each other, that you create some time to connect with each other, to check in with each other, to see what's going on, what is, you know, what's the partner experiencing generally or specifically at work, for example. Um, and also not just to talk, talking is one aspect of it, communication, obviously, we know that's really important, but the other side of it is also to kind of go out and have some fun together once in a while and do something that is uh, entertaining for you both. Yeah, and I, I sometimes I call this coffee machine syndrome, where basically your partner becomes like the coffee machine, so they become familiar, or like a piece of furniture, so after a while you've got so used to them being there that we, we sometimes don't appreciate them. Mm. Uh, in fact, sometimes the partner actually will appreciate the coffee machine more than the partner, <laughs> um, because you know it's one of these things that just because someone is there every day, we lose that appreciation, and it, it's so important to find that appreciation. In positive psychology, often it's talked about finding three things every day that you feel gratitude for. Uh, And that can be a way that can help people feel better about themselves. They can help them feel kind of uh, more positive generally. Um, I like to frame this in this context as finding things to find appreciation about. So it's always thinking about what do you appreciate about your partner? Uh, because one of the problems is, you know, when we meet somebody, we have these rose colored lenses on where we see them as magnificent. We think they're wonderful. We think they're the best person ever. Uh, and that stays for some time, you know, maybe a few months, maybe a year, uh, probably not much longer. But then we start to see the things we don't like about them. And then then we just get into this routine, like Angela said, and mm-hmm. we, we start to forget, we, we forget some of these qualities that we really loved. Mm-hmm. And it's not only so important to remember those things for your partner but also for yourself because when you wake up every day if you wake up and remember those things that you love about that person you feel great yourself it's not only that the other person feels great because they know they're appreciated but you can feel that sense of uh, sense of passion that sense of energy even after two years five years or however long it might be mm-hmm. and it really comes down I think largely to ourselves mm-hmm. it's about taking time to reflect in ourselves on a daily basis, you know, what are the things we appreciate about the other person? And a really interesting kind of side angle to that is also another common problem uh, that is uh, creating difficulties in relationships, often what we call emotional fusion, where you are too kind of enmeshed with each other, not separate enough. So it's kind of almost the opposite side of what we've just been talking about, where you live your parallel lives and you never come together. Sometimes when couples are spending too much time uh, depending on each other, not doing their own thing, not uh, sometimes, you know, meeting friends, etc., but sort of completely rely on each other for everything, that can also become very suffocating uh, and difficult in a relationship. 
Yeah, and I think one of the key things to me that you said there, and mm. you might you could always disagree, it was being sure, by now, is the word is depending and relying on. So it's not yeah. about being with your partner. Right. So you, you can be with your partner for you know indefinite amounts of time potentially, mm. but if that context where you have to depend on them or they depend on you or you rely on them, then it adds a slightly different power dynamic. Mm. Uh, and and you know that can even become quite toxic in relationships. So I think I think the key is it's it's not about that. Uh, you have to have a set amount of time with them. It's about when it becomes relying or depending and not being able to kind of live your own life as, as you want to as well, uh, that can be problematic. Yeah, it's kind of also thinking that, you know, in order to come together as a couple, in order to have this experience of coming together, in order to connect with your partner, you also have to be, you have to have an experience of being separate from your partner as well. You can only come together if you've been separate as well. So it's a sort of fine balancing act between dependency and independency and independence as well that is really important yeah absolutely good and should we move on to the next yeah one? okay well, so... we've got a list well stress uh, i put on stress here in a very general way because stress can be caused by all sorts of external factors the most common one of course that uh, people report in couples therapy is the is work stress but uh, and also followed by um, uh, childcare, for example, if you have uh, very young children, you're working full time, you have young children, it's stress in the sense of having lots and lots of different external demands made on you, and uh, and because you're feeling constantly stressed, you're constantly in this sense of high alert, you haven't really got capacity to focus on the needs of your partner, on the needs of the relationship. Yeah, and we all experience stress differently. So for some people, it could be long hours of work, it could be kind of challenges of money. Uh, for other people, it's something completely different. We all kind of react to things in different ways. So it's, it's often a learned experience from, from our own past. Mm -hmm. So how we deal with stress is something that you can learn. You can learn to deal with stress more differently. Mm -hmm. um, because you probably know people that seem to have huge amounts of things happening all the time, but they seem to handle it quite well. Mm -hmm. So managing stress is something that you can do and it's learning how you respond to it, what your triggers are, and then finding new ways to learn to respond to those triggers in different ways. And above all, just recognising that maybe you are under stress mm -hmm. and that you do need to take time to deal with this. And not just for yourself, but also in terms of your relationship. Mm -hmm. Knowing that, you know, if you take this time, look at the stress that's going on, learn a different way to deal with it, you can have a much closer relationship. And when you have a better relationship, you'll feel less stressed as well, because it's one of these mm -hmm. factors that, you know, when, when we're under pressure, if we lose track of our relationship, you might be under stress already, but if your relationship then fails, then that extra stress could really push people over the edge. And I've seen this with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So it's that those times where even when you're under the most stress, it's really important to take time to think about your relationship. Always remember the other person as well, because you know if, if something happens to a relationship as well, you know that, then that, that amount of stress is just going to go way up. Yeah, and I think I, I always find the, the idea of the stress bucket quite helpful. So um, it's kind of, as, as Tom said, it's kind of paying attention to your stress levels in the first place, knowing what's going on for you, and imagining that you've got, you've got so much capacity in your bucket for stress. And if you are overflowing, if your bucket is overflowing, that's going to come into the couple system. That's going to affect your partner as well. So when you're holding a lot of stress, there's likely to be some sort of contagion, as it were, where your partner also gets stressed. So it's kind of being mindful of that when your bucket is overflowing and finding some ways of regulating. Um, and that could be many different ways. Uh, that's different for everyone. It might be having, you know, some downtime. For some people, it's going for a run. For others, it's uh, doing a meditation session. For for others, yet, it's doing some knitting. It doesn't really matter what it is, as long as you're aware of uh, doing something that enables you to, to kind of regulate your stress level a little bit more. Absolutely. And interestingly, there's been research fairly recently that has shown it's even your attitude towards stress itself that has an effect. So mm -hmm. some people actually view stress as positive yeah. and some people view it as negative. They think that stress is going to cause them a lot of uh, health issues. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, just the outlook on stress is whether you see it as a negative thing or a positive thing uh, will actually influence how your body responds to it. So if you view stress as a very negative thing, you actually have a lot more chemicals released in the body, which are more damaging. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But if you actually see it as a positive thing that actually, you know, can somehow energize your body or have somehow make differences that can be more positive, uh, it's actually found that your body regulates it much better. So learning ways to actually think about the things that are happening and even changing your relationship with stress can be really important. Uh, but something related to that, but actually we were mm-hmm. going to talk about with the first one as well, I just remembered, was... Uh, you know, when we're under stress, or even at other times, it's easy not to take time to listen to your partner. Yes, we forgot to talk yeah, about listening. Yeah, we forgot to talk about that. And that's yes. also kind of ties in with lack of effort, because it's not just mm. when you're under stress, mm. but it's really important to, to listen to your partner. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's a, this is really important in response to uh, a lack of effort or, lack, or, or lots of stress, is to make some time to build into... The relationship where you actually literally sit down, and it, it doesn't have to be very long, it could just be 10 minutes, um, twice a week maybe, whatever you can manage, where you just sit down and listen to what your partner's got to say. Uh, just listen, reflect back, nothing else. It's really just a sort of a check-in to have an opportunity to to experience what's going on for your partner. That's very helpful. And that's usually what uh, disappears in lots and lots of relationships because there's so much work, because there's there's so many demands being made on the couple that this goes out of the window. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Sorry, were you saying something? No. Oh, no, no, no. I'm just joking. I'm just listening. So it's, and, and that's the thing as well, is you don't have to listen to try and find a solution. No. It's just listening. And I think this is one of the things that mm. um, often it's it's distinguished in sort of a male-female way of listening. But I think it, it's not general. You can't generalise mm. like that. Mm. Um, but it, it, I think it does happen more, I've found, where uh, sometimes women will experience that men maybe try and fix problems Mm. so we say something and you try and find a solution but actually sometimes we just want somebody to listen to us it's not it's not that we need a solution we just we just want to talk so sometimes just listening and just being there and being present and letting the other person know that you're listening is is what's required and it's Mm. so important it's very soothing absolutely yeah Good. So what else have we got on our list? Um, yeah, so feeling overwhelmed by your partner's demands. Very often this can be described as nagging by one partner, where one partner is constantly making, saying, you know, this is not good enough, that's not good enough, where one partner experiences the other partner as being very critical. Mm. And, uh, sorry, did you want to come in? And that can be related to, also it could be related to housework, sort of domestic chores, obviously that's where it plays out very frequently. Uh, it can be related to um, attention, uh, a complaint about not being present enough or too present for the other, making too many demands. So it's this sense of, you know, the, the, this sort of complaint, this constant sort of sense of that something is not quite right. The other person is wanting something of me that I cannot deliver. Yeah, and this is a really subtle one as well, because basically we can see this from both partners' mm. perspective. That we can sometimes project that onto the other person mm. where we see them as demanding, mm-hmm. uh, whereas sometimes the other person is demanding. And we t- in an earlier podcast, we talked about attachment styles, where we talked about anxious attachment styles, avoidance attachment styles, how somebody who's avoidant, if, he, if their partner is being kind of wanting more emotional kind of intensity or more emotional togetherness, mm-hmm. uh, the avoidant person may experience that as the other person being clingy or demanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas the, uh, the person who's anxious, if the other person maybe doesn't phone them twice or three times a day or text them constantly through the day, they may feel the other person is, is not loving them. Um, so these are things we need to reflect on ourselves. So where is it in ourselves that we see this in the other person and where is it in the other person? And also appreciating that you know, what's behind those demands. If the person you know, needs to be texted 10 times a day, what is, what is that person really saying? What is, the, what is their need? It's mm-hmm. that need for kind of maybe feeling love, feeling reassured and you know, seeking couples therapy, I'd, I'd say, is really important with something like that. Or so finding a way to kind of work together to have understanding of what's going on for each other, mm. help meet the needs without having to have that cleanness and kind of mm. the constant demands. Absolutely. Yeah, and sometimes it's also about compromise. So uh, particularly if we're looking at the sort of the whole arena of domestic chores, which obviously I think most couples experience on some level where there are different expectations about cleanliness, tidiness, etc., this needs to be discussed um, and this needs to be agreed upon um, and there needs to maybe be a little bit of compromising on both sides so that there's 
that this is not something that kind of plays out and takes up a lot of time and energy in the relationship. And usually it can be resolved. Yeah, and it needs to be discussed in, in, in just a relaxed way. Yeah. So because so many times I've seen it where it's, you know, it's after a certain number of weeks, one person snaps and says, why don't you ever take the rubbish out? Yeah. And the person doesn't even realise that they haven't been doing it. Well, maybe, yeah. maybe they should, but yeah, yeah. they haven't. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's something they never did in the past, so they just never even thought about it. And to the partner, it's things, well, that means you don't love me because you're not taking the rubbish out. Yes. But it doesn't mean that. It means that you know maybe they were unaware. And you need to have these conversations. It's about kind of setting up these agreements with each other, mm-hmm. particularly for these household things. I think it's just having some agreements about... You know, who does what and whatever it happens to be and maybe if somebody forgets then mm-hmm. it's not like thinking why didn't you do that it's just you know just quite calmly saying you know I, i'm just wondering if you if you realize you didn't take the rubbish out or mm-hmm. try not to be too passive aggressive about it yeah i'm not seeing it as an attack on uh, on the person who is who is uh, frustrated with that absolutely yeah Good. But moving on to the next one is about parenting. Mm. So something that may not uh, may not be appropriate for everybody because mm. you might not all be parents, but mm. parenting can bring up huge issues. Yeah, you know? I mean, uh, we could spend a whole pot, and I think we should do a special podcast episode, particularly on parenting, um, because it's so complex. And yeah. like, there's so many different factors that come into play here. So that uh, parenting uh, become it often becomes an issue to initially when uh, two become three, so when the first child is born, and that really completely changes the uh, relationship dynamic. So rather than uh, both partners getting attention from each other, the attention now is very often focused on the child, and one or both partners might feel frustrated with that, and sometimes a little bit jealous or envious even, um, because they're not getting that kind of attention anymore. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is also, of course, the, the time factor that, you know, the energy that uh, you previously had for each other is now going to be redirected into looking after the child, caring for the child, managing this on top of other demands that are being made on you, for example, work stress, we talked about that. So um, pa- that's one thing. That's for new parents. So that's a sort of whole issue around parenting issues that come up for new parents. And it really is important to just recognize that this is a major shift in your relationship. Well, I would say probably the single most, uh, the biggest shift you can ever experience in a relationship, having a child. Yeah, and also with that, it can be more challenging if you go into a relationship where the other person has a child or you have a child yeah. and the other person doesn't. And mm-hmm. suddenly they have a ready-made family. Mm-hmm. And that dynamic can be quite challenging. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how does the uh, other person's mm-hmm. child take to you? How do you take to them? How do you build that relationship? What is your role as a parent? Mm-hmm. So that can be really challenging. Uh, mm-hmm. One thing I would recommend with all of these challenges is is that you know it does have an effect on relationships. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's important to make sure you make time for your relationship too. Mm-hmm. So parenting takes time. It takes energy. It's really important that you keep consistent time that you have with your partner, whether that's having once a week, having a date night, Mm -hmm. going away for the occasional weekend. Make sure you schedule it because don't forget your relationship. Absolutely. Because if you go 16, 18 years without taking that time for your relationship afterwards, suddenly, again, that leads into the first point we made Mm -hmm. where lack of efforts, we Mm -hmm. tend to take them for granted. Yeah, and a lack of connection as well, ultimately. So keep that connection and and it takes effort, but put that time in. And even if you're tired, make Mm -hmm. sure you take that time, go out sometimes with your partner, spend some time with them Mm -hmm. because putting that time in really pays off. Yeah, and it's really important because you don't also want to start to relate to your partner as just uh, the father or the mother of your child. Uh, and I actually witnessed that with some couples as well, where they start talking to, they call, start calling each other mum or dad, and that gets very messy then. So they just sort of be, see each other, the primary function of their partner, as being a parent to the child. And that gets uh, very complicated, as you can imagine. So um, also another really important factor with with parenting is to make some time to clarify expectations because you might have a very clear idea in your in your mind in your head about how to parent your child, um, how to discipline, for example, you know how to manage all sorts of how to manage education, etc. But your partner might have a very different idea, and you might assume that you're on the same page with this, but very often you're not. So again, it's 
it's clarifying this, making the time to sit down and check in with each other. Are we, do we have the same idea about here about how we manage this with our child? Absolutely. I think also we can also sometimes substitute the word child for pets these days. <laughs> yeah, as well. yes, like, so people have that same sort of thing where the pets become like the children. Yeah, so. yeah, that's, yeah. is a whole other dimension. OK. Yeah. So let's move on to uh, the next challenge that a lot of people face is sex. So in terms of sex, well, you know, first of all, again, when you get into a relationship, maybe that's something that's kind of dominant feature, something that's quite important, more important. But then over time, it's easy to forget to put time into having intimate time with your partner. So this is one of the challenges, you know, and, and both we all have different kind of ideas about, you know, how frequently we want to have sex, sort of what sex involves for each of us. And yeah, again, having these discussions is really important. Mm. Yeah, it's just clarifying it. I mean, this is a this is really again a big a big area of discussion that we should come back to for another episode. But very often, the the difficulty around sex is around uh, different expectations, around uh, different needs, and different ideas about frequency. For example, is a very common one. There's often one partner who wants it more often than the other. Um, there are also, just to be clear, there are also relationships, long-term relationships, where the sex has completely disappeared, which can be a problem, uh, and for often there's one partner who experiences this as a problem, but for some couples they've also come to some uh, agreement about that this is how it is, and they're, you know, that's how they function, and they've kind of written it off. That's fine as long as both partners are in agreement about it. Um, and very often um, it's not just about sex. Uh, sex is also uh, synonymous with, with physical touch for a lot of couples. Some couples are quite happy if they just have hugs, they, you know, they stroke each other, they have that kind of physical connection. But it's an arena where often, uh, which is often difficult, for many couples really struggle to have a conversation about sex. They get very frustrated, they get quite hurt. Um, and they really struggle to express uh, their needs um, and, and, and just to, sort of, to have a conversation about it. It often goes underground. So it does also, again, it's back to this uh, whole uh, topic of communication. It does require also communication and some conversation about it. Where are we with this? Are we still both happy with this? Do we want something else? Do we want something do you know are we getting what we need from the relationship in that in that regard yeah and when it's not talked about again it can be a source of stress mm -hmm. so again somebody having needs the other person maybe not and sometimes a person one you know maybe one partner who doesn't want sex mm -hmm. it may be to do with kind of fears it may be to do with anxieties mm -hmm. that aren't expressed and yeah. at some level it's maybe not that they don't want that but mm -hmm. these things haven't been addressed and mm -hmm. uh, for many people and you know when when you have the agreement when we overcome those hurdles you know sexual intimacy can be that way to actually build a much a close relationship in different ways a different kind of intimacy so you know when we address these things you know when, when we speak about these things and kind of address each other's needs and find ways to kind of help bring together those needs mm -hmm. you can find that the relationship can go closer in different ways through that physical intimacy as well absolutely yeah yeah. Good. Okay, what else have we got on our list? Yeah, the influence of the, the wider family. Well, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to clients who uh, really struggled with meddling family members. And I'm saying meddling in the, sort of in the wider sense here, where a lot of time and energy is expended on um, working on the relationships with parents, parents-in-laws, siblings uh, who are interfering, where... Uh, one partner really gets very frustrated with the parents-in-law and their demands, um, and this causes conflict um, for both, basically for both uh, partners in the relationship. It causes conflict for for the partner whose family member is complained about. So they might have a very strong relationship with mum and dad, and the partner doesn't like that or feels there's too much connection. The parents are interfering too much in the relationship. And this is really quite complex um, because, of course, for the partner who has that close connection with the family, it's quite difficult to just cut the ties to say, I'm not going to have any more conversations with my parents, for example. Whereas, on the other hand, for the partner who constantly sees the interfering parents and also interfering parents who sometimes have not very positive influence, um, this can be very challenging. So this requires a lot of conversations as well about you know what you're both experiencing in that regard. 
Yeah, it can be a real challenge. You know, yeah. I've experienced that myself with uh, when my parents were alive. My mum was really wants to control sort of uh, who I'd go out with or whatever. So I wouldn't tell her who I was seeing. Yes. So, you know, I'd keep these things a secret because it would interfere with that. And, mm-hmm. you know, to me, it was very much, well, you know, you're, you're born into your family. You don't choose them, but you choose your partner. Mm-hmm. So I think that's also really important. It's the person you choose to be with. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, having made that choice, made that commitment, and then reflecting on, you know, how you let the family interfere with that very special relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's complex. I mean, we could be spending quite a lot of time uh, unpicking that. But, and this is sometimes uh, sometimes really also very relevant. If this is a big issue in a relationship, um, <clears throat> that uh, can really unpacked, uh, can be unpacked, can be looked at uh, really well in couples therapy. Just sort of see, look at the dynamics there, and 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 deciding what's the best way forward here to manage this, to manage these external, these other relationships that we have. And this might not only be, uh, just to be clear, it might not only be family members, it could also be close friends who interfere, who kind of part, become part of the, the, the marriage, so to speak, or the relationship, who, you know, who just take up too much space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I remember watching one sitcom or something where you've got the married couple and suddenly, you know, the, the wife comes into the living room and there's always like some friend, they suddenly get startled by is asleep on the sofa. So it's yes. like their friends just seem to be living in the house without any sort of agreement. That can be really challenging. Yeah, that can be, you yeah. know, there might be different needs. There might be one partner who needs to have a lot of social contact and also likes to be out about and have friends over all the time might get too much for the other. All of these kind of uh, uh, things need to be looked at and discussed as well. Yeah, I wonder why you looked at me when you said that. <laughs> so uh, the next one we could talk about is uh, what would, behavioural issues, and one of those behavioural kind of problems could be addiction problems. So uh, you know, addiction could be alcohol, it could be drug dependency, it could be well, there's lots of different types of addiction, sex addiction. So there's kind of many different types of addiction. These can be real problems in relationships. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, if you are if you're living with somebody who is an alcoholic, for example, that's creating that obviously throws up all sorts of uh, difficulties. Um, there's also uh, it would be very interesting then to look at the, the whole area of codependency. Why are you as um, why are you in a relationship with somebody who has dependency issues? So they are they are you know it needs to be if there are addiction issues, this really needs to be looked at from all angles, and you need additional support. I would say. It's not something, if, particularly if there's quite severe uh, alcohol or drug addiction, this is going to interfere with your relationship. And you can't really resolve that on your own. So my recommendation would be to, to seek some external help. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that really needs really needs external help. Mm. Yeah, it's very difficult to do on your own. It's not that it can't be, but it's very much more difficult, much more challenging. Yeah. Good. Okay, well, so we've got on our list. Well, the last one is the issue of having an affair. Um, that obviously interferes with relationships. Um, and we were having this discussion just before we started this podcast. I don't actually see many couples come to me where this manifests as an issue. And, and Tom's argument was, well, maybe they don't come to couples therapy because uh, they've already ended their relationship. And that might be true. So affairs obviously um, are um, the one of the most devastate, devastating experiences couples can have in relationships. Um, arguably, um, they can be overcome, they can be um, worked through if uh, there is an understanding of what led to the affair in the first place, uh, if they can be forgiven, if there can be acceptance and forgiveness. Um, couples can absolutely recover from an affair, but, it's, uh, it, you, the, but the relationship goes through a period of grief in the first instance, particularly on, on the part of the partner who has um, who has been betrayed so I'm using this in inverted commas now um, there are very good reasons for affairs um, usually they don't from my experience they don't happen out of nowhere for no apparent reason and often they can be a manifestation of issues that were already sort of latently manifest in the relationship and that's often something that needs to be looked at as well as part of the couples therapy 
Yeah, and this is something that actually also reflects in terms of those things in relationships that if we cross a boundary, is there a coming back or not? And I think this reflects very much personal values. And this is something we could talk about in another podcast, Mm -hmm. is if you think about now as well, what is most important to you in your intimate relationship or your Mm -hmm. personal relationship, you know, that relationship with that special person? Mm -hmm. And think about what those things are. And we're looking for sort of word, just single words, like it could be, it could be happiness, honesty, trust, it could be understanding. So we're thinking about what are those things that are most important. Yeah. And with some of these values as well, say, for example, it was trust, it was loyalty. If you have a value like loyalty, and that's really, really kind of one of these key values to you, mm-hmm. all these values have a threshold that if somebody goes beyond that threshold, there may be no coming back from it. Mm-hmm. Different people will have different values. And we have values in all aspects of our life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and depending on what these values are, it depends whether we can recover from them. It also is something that when we get into a relationship, it's probably more important to know about your partner's values and what's important to them Mm -hmm. than, you know, what they like doing in their spare time. Because a lot of time, you know, when we go and date somebody, it's maybe based on, you know, what do they like doing, some of the more superficial Mm -hmm. things, but actually understanding what their values are is so important so that later in a relationship, we don't run into this clash of values. Absolutely. Good point. And we could explore that in another podcast. That might be interesting. Values, yeah. Good. Excellent. Good. I so, think we've kind of worked through our list, haven't we? Yeah, so we're forgotten? going to wrap wrap this one up. Yeah. Uh, and remember, if you want to find out more about how to improve your relationships, head over to therelationshipmaze.com. Please share this podcast and press subscribe now if you haven't already. Okay, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye for now. Bye.